Rojan Rosandi untuk uh, menyampaikan beberapa pengalaman dan di akhir barangkali ada sedikit tutorial untuk uh, mengerjakan apa namanya metode finite element dengan menggunakan library atau pustaka yang namanya ng-solve. Nah, saya rasa di di kalau saya sendiri juga ini merupakan satu pustaka yang baru ya mungkin nanti kita kita dengarkan bersama. Kemudian di akhir mudah-mudahan uh, kita semua berkesempatan juga untuk melakukan sedikit latihan tutorial. Jadi dari uh, akun yang sudah uh, dibuatkan di Guriang itu rekan-rekan sekalian bisa mencoba di sana karena ng shop saya sudah uh, uh, install di Guriang juga dan mudah-mudahan saja tidak uh, overload <laughs> karena memang kita menggunakan uh, satu komputer saja walaupun nanti ada beberapa trik bagaimana cara menggunakan uh, apa program dengan Python menggunakan komputasi paralel. Nah, uh, barangkali kalau saya bisa share dulu sebentar ya, uh, Nadia. Saya share dulu. Bentar. Jadi barangkali nanti supaya memudahkan untuk proses ininya apa namanya? Uh, oh, sebentar ini bagaimana? Mohon maaf. Share-nya salah. Share. Nah, mungkin sudah enggak apa-apa lah ini aja. Nah, berarti sudah bisa dilihat ya. Jadi di sini itu ada eh uh, sebentar. Ini yang mana yang di share? <laughs> Saya agak ini kalau menggunakan Zoom. Jadi ada uh, dokumen dan di sini ada menggunakan MPI untuk Python saya di sini ya. Jadi Anda bisa bisa coba. Saya rasa kalau nanti uh, di ng nya menggunakan MPI ya bisa. Tapi untuk saat ini mungkin tidak perlu menggunakan MPI dulu. Jadi bisa dikerjakan di sini. Di sini ada ada beberapa petunjuk termasuk juga kalau nanti menginginkan di, di submit ke uh, node di computation node jadi bisa dilakukan nah ini saya pikir cukuplah untuk memberikan sedikit uh, apa namanya clue bagaimana kita me menggunakan Python di uh, uh, parallel environment nah nanti saya pikir uh, apa namanya Rojan bisa bisa memandu bagaimana caranya supaya Uh, apa namanya uh, para peserta juga bisa mencoba di uh, notebooknya masing-masing mungkin itu terima kasih Nadia dan selamat uh, mengikuti workshop baik terima kasih Pak Yudi atas pengarahannya selanjutnya uh, saya serahkan kepada Bapak Rozan kepada Pak Rozan waktu dan tempat saya persilahkan Oke, okay, uh, terima kasih. Um, tunggu saya share dulu screennya. Uh, screen. Oh, ini juga bisa ya. Oke, okay, sip. Ya, slide terlihat tidak? Bisa ada feedback nggak? Ya. Yeah? Oke, okay, so, uh, jadi uh, sebenarnya saya ini uh, mempersiapkan presentasi, presentasinya dalam bahasa Inggris. Jadi uh, apa tidak apa-apa kalau apa ya? Yeah. Presentasi dalam bahasa Inggris, ya. Oh, saya okay. saya lupa, uh, Rojan, mohon maaf ini yeah. uh, siapa Nadia. Uh, rencananya memang ada rekan kita dari Jerman yang ikut akan ikut, gitu. tapi saya pikir belum hadir. Jadi kalau nanti beliau hadir ya kita switch saja ke dalam bahasa Inggris itu aja ya. Kalau misalnya hadir kita fleksibel saja. Oh, kan okay. ada Maureen dari Jerman juga, itu kan dari luar juga. <laughs> oh, ada juga. Ya. <laughs> So, uh, good then, I think I can start now. So, uh, hello everyone, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Rosan Rosandi, and as, said, uh, as mentioned before, I'm a PhD student in mathematics at TU Kaiserslautern. Uh, the focus of my research is uh, also mentioned earlier, the um, numerical analysis of PDE constraint shape optimization problems in solid mechanics, especially those involving thin elastic cell structures. 
Today, uh, I would like to give a talk about solving PDEs, partial differential equations, uh, using the finite element software and the solve. Okay, so um, good. Uh, here's an overview of uh, today's uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, first I will talk about uh, the finite element method. So I have I've heard before that so, so the finite element method is uh, quite popular here actually for mathematicians and also uh, and also engineers. Uh, but uh, I have heard that there's uh, no one in at one part who is uh, doing the finite element method now. So um, I would like uh, to ask you uh, the following question first. So um, how many of you are familiar with the finite element method and the, um, and the variational or, or the weak formulation of partial differential equations? So um, perhaps you could maybe just write in the chat. So if someone is uh, knows about it, uh, can you please uh, say yes in the chat so I can get a grasp of uh, how many people is, uh, yeah, know, know this uh, topic? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So just uh, yeah, write write in the chat. Okay. So uh, I'm waiting for other people so so that I can uh, adjust uh, yeah my my presentation today a little bit. Okay. Okay. Fine. Difference not at all. Okay. So a little bit, uh, does it mean uh, that you have heard of it before or do you know the general framework, something? So, so if I say weak formulation of um, partial differential equations, does it say something or, or not? Okay, good. So it seems that uh, the, um, yeah, mo most of you have uh, a little bit knowledge about it. Okay. so. Um, perhaps um, if it's too much, maybe I can also skip over uh, the basics uh, in the beginning. But okay, let, let's just continue um, with, with the overview. So first, uh, I will do the uh, introduction into the finite element method. Then, uh, so if yeah, if um, the majority of you do not know it, then uh, I will talk also a little bit about the variational uh, formulations of elliptic PDEs. And in the second half, uh, we will also have. Uh, uh, an, an interactive tutorial um, using ng so, uh, using the, the Python notebook. Okay, good. So uh, let's start uh, with the um, numerical treatment. Oh, I cannot. Uh, no, okay. Let's start with the numerical treatment of uh, partial differential equations. So as opposed to um, particle simulations using, for example, the uh, discrete element method, which will be the talk of uh, Professor um, Nina Gunkelmann uh, when she recovers from her illness, uh, we are dealing with continuum mathematical models where uh, the objects of interest are fields defined on some domain omega. And those fields describe um, or, or represent the physical, uh, the, the current state of the physical system and are governed by some equations depending on some uh, temporal and spatial derivatives, uh, such as Maxwell's equations in electrodynamics, uh, balance laws in continuum mechanics, or uh, the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics. And in general, uh, there's no closed form or analytical solution um, to those uh, governing equations, which is why we rely on numerical approximations. Some popular methods uh, for solving PDEs um, include the uh, finite difference method, the finite volume method, and also the finite element method, uh, which will be the main topic of this talk. Okay. So uh, NGSolve is an open source uh, finite element software based on the automatic mesh generator NetGen written by Joachim Schürbel from the um, Technical University of Vienna. And uh, it is implemented in C++ and has a fa fairly uh, intuitive Python interface, uh, similar to the um, Phoenix project, another um, uh, popular computing platform for solving PDEs. So perhaps uh, some of you have heard of Phoenix. And um, the reason why I'm using ng-solve is, uh, so this is actually, um, uh, in active development now. And recently there's also uh, a new module co uh, called the shape optimization module, which is uh, the main reason why uh, I uh, use it. 
Okay, so and uh, to understand uh, the uh, how the scripting works in NGSolve, uh, it is important uh, to at least know the uh, general framework of the finite element method. So that's also why I asked uh, whether you have, uh, some of you have heard of it before. Good. So uh, let's continue. So uh, in in this talk, uh, we will focus on the following uh, model problem: the stationary heat equation. Uh, as mentioned before, we are given some domain omega and uh, the temperature at some time t and position x is denoted uh, by the symbol u. And as you know, in its simplest form, the uh, diffusion of heat in this domain here is, this, is described by the following uh, equation here, which says that the um, temporal derivative of uh, u uh, is equal to the Laplacian of uh, u plus some source term f. Okay, and of course, in the stationary case, uh, the temporal derivative vanishes. So we are left with uh, the following equation, which is the well-known um, Poisson equation. And uh, the task is now to find a temperature field u such that this equation here is fulfilled for every um, x in the domain. Okay. Uh, but as you know, um, this equation here, uh, this equation alone is not enough to specify a unique solution. So that's why uh, to obtain a well-posed problem, we need to impose additional uh, conditions. And today uh, we will consider uh, two types of boundary conditions. Um, the first type is the so-called Neumann boundary. Here uh, we prescribe that the uh, normal derivative of the temperature field uh, u is equal to some given uh, Neumann delta g, so on the Neumann boundary uh, gamma n. And also on another part of the boundary, um, in the red part um, here, we have the Dirichlet boundary, and here we uh, prescribe some fixed value um, for the temperature field u. And uh, this is a prototype of, uh, or, or a classical, yeah, a prototype of an elliptic boundary value problem. And now the question is, um, how um, can we solve this uh, problem here numerically on the computer? Okay. So good. The, yeah, okay. These are just uh, the descriptions of the variables if you want to look it up. So okay. Uh, and to do that, uh, we would like uh, we want to um, compare the uh, discretization methods uh, mentioned in the uh, very first slide. So we have the finite difference method, the finite volume method, and the uh, finite element method. Um, in the finite difference method, uh, what we do is we overlay a regular grid on the domain omega and uh, approximate the um, differential operator. So the, La La the Laplacian of u, we approximate it with finite differences at each grid point, okay? And uh, this is the most straightforward way to discretize a PDE and leads to a system of um, finitely many uh, equations uh, depending on the nodal values of uh, uh, the solution. Okay. And the numerical solution is then chosen as um, yeah, the set of nodal values uh, which um, uh, yeah, uh, fulfill the discretized system. Okay, so. Um, this is that is the idea in the finite difference method, and for example, if you have uh, such uh, uh, I mean, if you have boundaries like this, uh, uh, we would I mean, I mean, if you if you look at the Laplace uh, operator here, we would get something which is called the five point stance. Uh, some of you have heard of it, and at the boundary, we can also apply uh, some kind of uh, shortly valor scheme um, to uh, to get a um, yeah, nice discretization of this domain. So, uh, by the way, if you have any questions, um, yeah, don't hesitate uh, to um, yeah, to interrupt me. Okay. So, in the finite volume method, it is quite different. So, um, here, uh, so the values that you want to compute are the grid points, so the intersections of these grid lines here. So, in the finite volume method, what we are interested in are average values of the grid cells. Okay. So, instead of uh, yeah, de determining the nodal values, we want to have average values over this cells. And uh, this is a popular method uh, for uh, fluid flow problems because um, the flux terms, so if we, yeah, if we uh, simulate some uh, fluid problems, uh, we can compute the flux terms 
uh, here using the divergence theorem. And also another advantage um, over the finite difference method is that in the finite volume method, we are not restricted to use a regular grid. So we can also use uh, some kind of uh, unstructured mesh for the finite volume method. And this is one similarity, similarity that we have with the finite element method. In the finite element method, um, we divide the domain into smaller subdomains, so for example, here, triangles. And the basic idea of the finite element method is to approximate the actual solution, so the solution field in each subdomain with a linear combination of so-called safe functions, which fulfill certain interpolation conditions. Okay, And uh, to understand it more, uh, we will consider a simple case namely the case of uh, linear triangular elements. Okay, so uh, for that, we assume that our domain can be triangulated exactly. So instead of here, instead of those curve boundary, we just assume that our domain is exactly this uh, polygonal domain here. Um, there are also finite elements where we use curve boundaries like this, but uh, for today's talk, uh, we will uh, restrict ourselves to, uh, to the simple case here. And uh, yeah, so linear triangular elements, what does it mean? Uh, triangular means, uh, just means that the subdomains are all, are all triangles and linear means that in each um, uh, tri is, yeah, triangle, we want to approximate the solution with a linear polynomial. So, and linear triangular elements are also called uh, P1 or Courant elements in the two dimensional case. So uh, let's look at a specific uh, triangle here, which we will call T. Um, the, vertices of the triangle, uh, I will call them x1 until x3. And as I said before, uh, we want to have safe functions and those uh, fulfill certain interpolation conditions, in this case, um, the so-called nodal basis property. So um, what this basically says is that the ith safe function, which I denote by psi, um, should be the uniquely determined um, uh, linear polynomial which interpolates the value one at the node i and the value zero at the other nodes. Okay, what this basically means is um, for, for the linear triangular element, we have exactly three safe functions and they are given by the following linear polynomial. So yeah, psi one is just um, the linear polynomial which interpolates the value one at the node one and zero otherwise. Psi two interpolates uh, the other, uh, node and uh, SI3 um, likewise, okay? So we have three safe functions and what we want uh, to have is a linear combination of, uh, so, so in each uh, subdomain, we want to approximate the solution with a linear combination of these safe functions. And by this construction here, um, so by the nodal basis property, we also see that, ah, if we have a linear polynomial, then, um, at the nodes here, uh, the, the, the nodal values are, or, or, um, or and, uh, okay, say it in, in another way, uh, the coefficients of the linear combination is by construction exactly the nodal values of, um, uh, yeah, of the linear polynomial, okay? And now uh, you can um, imagine if we have two triangles, then uh, also by this construction here, they uh, would be continuous at the interface uh, so that uh, if we are given a set of nodal values uh, of this mesh here, we can create some kind of, a, uh, of yeah, we can reconstruct some function using piecewise linear polynomials. And now our task is to determine nodal values such that these, uh, re, uh, so that, so that, so, uh, such that this reconstruction is a good approximation to the actual solution, so to the solution field we want to have, which uh, of course depends on the PTE. Um, okay, good. Any questions up to here? So uh, just uh, tell me if it's uh, too fast or too slow uh, so, so that I can adjust um, the speed. So, okay. and. Um, yeah, let's continue. So to know what is meant by a good approximation, uh, sadly, we require a little bit uh, more of, of the mathematical theory uh, behind it. 
So what we would like to do now is to, uh, is uh, talking about the so-called variational formulation of elliptic uh, PDEs. And first, maybe I will just uh, summarize. Uh, so what is meant by a elliptic uh, by an elliptic uh, partial differential equation? So um, yeah, we are considering uh, second order linear uh, partial differential equations. Th uh, those are yeah, the linear partial differential equations, uh, PDEs, which can be written in the following form. So we have, uh, oh, okay, uh, this is a typo. So it should be C times U, by the way, uh, I forgot it. So uh, this is a general uh, form, uh, the general form of a second order linear PDE. And um, we just, uh, abbreviate this part here with LU. So L is then called, is then a differential operator. It should be equal to some, uh, to, uh, to some term F. And uh, this uh, PDE is called elliptic. If uh, the matrix, uh, which consists of the coefficients here uh, behind the principal part, so behind the part uh, of order two, if uh, this matrix is a symmetric positive definite or negative definite, then uh, this PD is called elliptic. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, moreover, there is also something called uniform ellipticity, but I will just leave out the definition. So uh, what what important is that if we have a uniformly elliptic PDE, then we have something which is called the maximum principle from which uh, we can show that the solution to the um, PDE depends continuously on the boundary data, which is another way to say that uh, if we prescribe boundary values uh, for this PDE is then we will get a well-posed problem. Uh, anyhow, this is not quite important for today's talk, but uh, what important is, is that uh, we can do some kind of a transformation such that uh, the analysis can be reduced to the case where v is equal to z, uh, I mean, uh, where, uh, okay, uh, where, it is, uh, where a is equal to the um, identity matrix such that, uh, yeah, so we can reduce the case, uh, we can reduce the whole thing here to the case where LU is just given by minus the Laplacian of u, okay? So, and uh, yeah, using uh, some kind of a transformation, um, every result that we have shown for this case here can, be, can also be transferred to the general case. So today we will just look at this uh, simple case here. And uh, to uh, repeat, uh, we are, so, so we have the following boundary value problem with the Neumann boundary uh, conditions and the Dirichlet boundary conditions. And this is also referred to as the strong formulation of the boundary value problem. So uh, good, now we want to go to the weak formulation. And the idea is just, um, this solution to this boundary value problem here is actually also the minimizer of some kind of an energy functional. Okay, so perhaps uh, some of you in in, in um, classical mechanics have heard of it about the Lagrangian mechanics. So the this problem here is actually the so-called uh, Euler-Lagrange equations. Yeah, with respect to some energy functional. So, and the weak formulation is just, uh, you know, if, if you have an energy uh, functional, then if, um, if you have a stationary point of the energy functional, then um, its derivative um, should be equal to zero. And uh, that is basically what, what the weak formulation is. And to get that from this uh, strong formulation here, uh, we multiply this equation here. So minus the Laplacian of u is equal to f with uh, some kind of a test function phi, okay? And integrate over the whole domain omega. So what we would get is then the following equation. And then if we use the um, integration by parts and the di divergence theorem, um, we, would also, we would get the following express expression here, which is called the weak formulation of the elliptic PDE, okay? So, and uh, now we also see here uh, for, for the strong formulation, what we require is a function which is defined point wise and is also twice uh, continuously differentiable to, to be able to apply the Laplace, uh, to, uh, to be able to, um, yeah, um, apply the Laplace in operator. Um, so, uh, but here in the weak formulation, so the idea is to um, also allow functions which are, uh, 
uh, less regular than the functions required for the strong formulation. So what we actually require for the weak formulation are functions which are just uh, square integrable. So the square of u uh, should be integrable and um, the derivative of it should also be square integrable such that this expression here um, yeah, can be written down. So that's why we consider um, so, uh, functions which lie in the solution space or in, 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 the, in the following function space here, which is also called the subordinate space. So this is just the space of all square integrable functions such that all partial derivatives of these functions are also square integrable. Okay, so this is the uh, sobolus phase H1. And this will be important uh, for the scripting we will do later in, in GSOLV. Uh, we also have an abstract notation of the reformulation. So this part here, uh, yeah, we will just write it down as A, which, uh, so a bilinear form A, which depends on a, a so-called trial function U and the test function phi is equal to some other linear functional, uh, which we will call B. Yeah, this is- uh, uh, Rosan, yes. can I yes. interrupt you? <laughs> Sorry? Can I interrupt you? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no problem, yes. Okay, so uh, when you define the function space in subless space, uh, you yes. mentioned that the derivative of U in K, a subscript K, the K U, it should be in the L2 uh, space. Does it yes. be in this C2 or L2, since this is a derivative? This is the derivative. Uh, okay, so uh, because uh, because of time constraints, of course, there are a lot of theory uh, involved behind this. So uh, yeah. this should be the weak derivative of U. Okay. So, uh, so or what was that your question? This, so it should be in L2, not in C2. No, it should be in L2. So L2 is the space of square integrable functions. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, okay. since I know that that is the for the derivative should be in the continuous differentiable in C2, but it's in inseparable. Okay. So so I mean if if yeah, if if you want to um discuss it, uh again, we are considering integrable functions. So this okay, are not... okay, 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 yeah, okay, good. So uh, we are, uh, if you want the details, so I, I would like to skip this because of time constraints, but if you want uh, uh, the details, um, we are considering integrable functions. So functions which are not even defined point-wise. And uh, for those functions, there's a concept called weak derivatives. And this is what I meant with the derivative of u with respect to k. So this should be the weak derivative of u, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps uh, I mean, if if I had more time, perhaps I could go into detail. But uh, this is uh, I would like to um, focus on the practical part of the finite element method. So there are quite a lot of theory that you can do here, actually. So, um, but now again to to come back, uh, important are the following terms here. Okay, so we have some kind of a problem. So, for example, the Poisson equation here and uh, we turn it into a weak formulation which in general uh, looks as follows yeah and the notions that are important are yeah, the bilinear form the linear form here uh, the trial function u which is which should be our solution and the test function okay and uh, a solution to this equation here to the strong formulation is called a classical solution so and usually those classical solutions are c2 functions so uh, functions that are um, twice continuously differentiable, but here uh, the weak solution to an elliptic uh, boundary value, value problem is given by a function u, which satisfies this weak formulation here for all test functions phi, okay? And the thing is, why is it called a weak solution? Well, it's simple because if you have a classical solution, then it is a weak solution, but not all weak solutions is uh, uh, are so not not all weak solution is a classical solution. But if you have a weak solution which is twice continuously differentiable, then it is also a classical solution, uh, which can also be seen by this uh, yeah reformulation here. Okay. Good. Any questions up to now? I know. I mean, it, it looks a bit uh, theoretical, but uh, it is important uh, to know this uh, form here, to understand uh, how NGSolve uh, works. Okay, good. 
Now, so coming back to the previous question, so what I have told you is that, okay, we want to determine nodal values such that the reconstruction is a good approximation to the solution field, okay? And how to do that? Well, uh, we are doing something which is called a Galaka projection. So uh, the bilinear form A here, yeah? Under certain conditions, for example, if the um, elliptic PDE, uh, if the PDE, PDE is uniformly elliptic, then we can show that this bi uh, bilinear form here uh, defines an inner product yeah? uh, on the space, uh, on the uh, Sobolev space here, uh, with the energy norm yeah, given by the square root of a u u. And now um, we want to have a good approximation. So, uh, but uh, on the computer, we can also uh, only consider finite dimensional subspaces. So, uh, I mean, a finite dimensional solution. So uh, we consider a finite dimensional subspace of um, the function space uh, here, uh, which is spanned by n uh, basis vectors. And the idea of the Galakian projection is uh, we want to get the best approximation uh, to uh, an orthogonal projection with, with respect to this inner product. So if uh, you can look at this picture here, so if u is the exact solution to the um, if uh, to uh, to the problem to the boundary value problem, and then uh, we uh, we have some kind of a finite dimensional subspace, uh, and the solution is not exactly in the finite dimensional subspace, um, we can obtain the best approximation by projecting the solution here onto the finite dimensional subspace, yeah? Because, yeah, I mean, then this is uh, the, uh, the solution or the approximation, which is closest uh, to the actual solution U with respect to this energy norm here, okay? So, and what does it mean if uh, U minus UH is orthogonal? Uh, to, to the space VH, where well, it, it, it just means that, yeah, so A of U minus UH uh, and VH should be equal to zero. So it means that it is orthogonal for all uh, test functions in VH. And this is equivalent to the fact that uh, A of UH, uh, VH is equal to B of VH. So, and now, um, yeah, UH lies in the finite dimensional space VH. Um, which means that we can write it as a linear combination of the basis functions uh, phi one until phi n. And if we plug it in into this equation, uh, we can obtain uh, this solution UH here uh, yeah, by solving the discretized system A, U, uh, A times U is equal to B, uh, where yeah, U is a factor of um, uh, what do you call it, uh, degrees of freedom. So the nodal values, uh, B is the right-hand side or also called the load factor and A is our system matrix, which consists of, uh, yeah, so the, the, the elements or the entries of A are just uh, the bilinear form A um, where we plug in uh, the basis functions phi i and phi j into it, okay? So from this, we obtain a linear system and we can use, yeah, anything we want, uh, uh, I mean, uh, some, uh, with direct methods or um, iterative methods to solve this um, uh, linear equation here. Good, so, and uh, now we consider the simplest case, the case of finite elements. So here, this is quite general. So I, I, I talk about the finite dimensional subspace. So uh, it uh, here, it does not have anything to do with the finite element uh, method. Now um, we, Okay, we, we explain or I explain uh, what is uh, meant by the finite element method. So the, in the finite element method, we choose a particular finite dimensional subspace of the, of the uh, solution space. And yeah, in the case of linear finite elements, this space here is uh, chosen as the space of all functions, sorry, uh, phi, which are continuous uh, on the uh, domain omega, such that if we restrict the function, uh, to some subdomain T, then it should be a linear polynomial for all subdomains T, okay? So this is the so-called uh, linear finite element space. And uh, now uh, we also consider the nodal basis property again. So uh, the basis functions 
are then just given by the functions uh, which fulfill this interpolation conditions here. And yeah, in the one dimensional case, uh, for example, if we have um, an interval from X0 to X4, and we subdivide it into uh, four in uh, sub intervals, then um, the uh, basis functions, the linear head functions are just given by, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the basis functions are then just given by the uh, following linear head functions here. For example, phi one is the one uh, marked in red. Um, and in the two dimensional case, for example, if we have the grid I have shown you before, then at each node, we have a linear head function, uh, yeah, which is just the um, piecewise uh, linear polynomial, um, which is equal to one at the uh, node x i and zero otherwise. Okay, good. And now our task is to compute this system here. So we want to compute the entries of A. And uh, in the case of the Poisson's equation, so A, the entries of it, are given by the integral of uh, nabla of phi i times uh, nabla of phi j. And uh, if we integrate over omega, we can also, uh, due to the linearity of the integral, uh, integrate over each subdomain. And this is the idea of uh, the finite element method because we know that these linear head functions are functions which, are, which have a small support. So if we consider, for example, here uh, phi one and phi three, and if we take the derivative of it and then multiply them, then uh, yeah, because uh, phi one is zero in this subinterval and phi three is zero in this uh, um, subinterval, we see that uh, the entry of the stiffness matrix is equal to uh, it should be equal to zero. Uh, uh, but but if you for example consider phi one and phi two, then here we have an intersection which is non-zero, and here we um, we need to compute what the integral of this expression is, okay? But a more efficient way is not to consider every combination of these uh, safe functions here, but to uh, consider, uh, to, to, to uh, assemble the stiffness matrix A here um, element-wise uh, by, by, by this uh, formulation here. So yeah, we can just split up the sums and then uh, we define the element stiffness matrix to be only this part here. Okay, and we can do the same for the load factor B. So um, the element stiffness matrix is just the integral um, of this expression here over one um, element T and B also um, the same. So, so the right hand side uh, over one element T. And the idea is now to, so, so to compute this term efficiently, uh, the idea is to first transform um, this t here, so we have a lot of t's, for example, here, I mean, we have this t, this t, and any other, but now the idea is we want to transform all of these triangles here into one single reference element, which is, for example, like this. Yeah, so we transform one triangle into this reference element here using uh, the inverse of, uh, of the Gamma. And now over this reference element here, the linear polynomials offer the triangles here to the following three functions here. So, I mean, the, the first safe function is uh, psi one, which is just given by yeah, the uniquely determined uh, linear um, polynomial, which interpolates one at zero and zero otherwise, and so on, okay? And uh, because we know an exact uh, representation of these uh, safe functions here, we can integrate. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can we can compute uh, the uh, values of the element stiffness matrix here independent of uh, the triangle T, or, ex or or better said, not not really independent, but uh, only dependent on the uh, geometric constants which depend on the vertices of the triangle. Okay, so we would get an element stiffness matrix, in this case, a three by three ma matrix uh, for each combination. And, yeah, uh, and the entries here only depend on the uh, location of the vertices of the triangle. 
So it, yeah, in this sense, we can pre-compute um, the element stiffness matrix, or if it is not possible, we can also do a numerical integration. And at the end, we can assemble the stiffness matrix A here element-wise, such that we get this global uh, system here. Okay, good. So that's uh, all uh, maybe a bit um, too much in detail, but the uh, good thing about this is uh, if you want to work with ND solve, we don't have to um, care about this. Okay, so um, this is how it is done uh, normally. So uh, normally we just uh, um, yeah, pre-compute the stiffness matrix and then assemble the global matrix. But in um, ND solve, we have something uh, which is called the um, expression assembler. And for the expression assembler to work, we don't need all of these theories here. The only thing we need to know is the weak formulation of our um, problem. Okay, so this is the only thing that is required. And uh, yeah, before coming uh, to the tutorials, um, maybe I will talk a little bit about uh, what other kinds of finite elements uh, there is. So in the linear triangular elements, uh, again, those are also called uh, uh, those are also called Lagrange elements because they fulfill this uh, nodal basis property here. Uh, but there are also other kinds of uh, elements, and here, for example, the Lagrange elements for for the triangle are given as follows. So here we have the linear triangular elements, or what I have to, uh, explained to you before. And this is the quadratic uh, triangular element. So in uh, we have a quadratic polynomial, which is uniquely determined by the nodal values here. And this is the cubic triangular element. And they are also, so we don't have to use triangles. Uh, popular in the industry are also quadrilateral elements here. Yeah, we have quadrilaterals and the nodal or the nodes are given by the following red uh, points here. And yeah, this is the bilinear case. Here uh, we would get something um, which is uh, cubic. And this here we also would get something which is uh, quadric. So um, yeah, besides the Lagrange elements with this uh, nodal basis property, we also have, for example, Hermit elements where we don't only have the nodal values of the um, polynomials, but also the derivatives. Yeah, for example, this is the cubic hermit uh, element where we also specify um, the derivative in x in an y direction at the uh, vertices of the triangle. Uh, we also have so-called serendipity elements where if we do not want to evaluate uh, the function in the interior uh, for the quadrilateral element, uh, then the serendipity element is a better choice. And I mean, I could talk, uh, I mean, the whole day about this, there are also non-conforming elements where uh, we do not require that the reconstruction is a continuous function. So uh, in this case, so, uh, so conforming elements are elements where um, yeah, the, the um, finite dimensional space lies in the function space, but uh, it is not at all required for the finite element method. So you can also use uh, non-conforming elements. And also, as I told you before, in the example, we also have curved boundaries. So we have triangles with curved boundaries, and uh, those are so-called isoparametric elements. So you can you are not restricted to um, domains that are polygonal. So you can also have curved boundaries. OK, good. Uh, that's all to the theory. Now, <laughs> uh, we also want to see something. So um, um, let me also look at the time. Okay, good. That's okay. So we have uh, an inter or I have an interactive tutorial. So uh, what we can do is we we can use the Jupyter notebook on the uh, Guriang um, HPC, and there's also an uh, NGSoft documentation. So the the, the the tutorials I will do today with you are uh, based on on the documentation uh, given here on this side here. This is it, it's just a stripped down version. So uh, a simpler version of um, of the examples given here, and also if you are interested, you can also look at the ng-solve um, source code, uh, which is hosted on GitHub. So, and also uh, before we continue, um, there are generally three options uh, how you can uh, visualize your data in um, ng-solve. 
you can either use the NetGen graphical user interface. So um, yeah, if you are working in Linux or something like that, you can just, uh, yeah, if you have installed NetGen and ng solve, you can just type net, uh, NetGen, then it will show you the graphical user interface uh, and you can work with it. Or uh, you can also export uh, the um, uh, results as a VTK file, so from the visualization toolkit and uh, view it using, for example, a para view, if you have heard of it. But what we will do today is uh, we will rely on the web GUI visualization, uh, which is available for the Python notebook. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, here are, by the way, the main references. I will come back to this maybe uh, after we have done the uh, tutorials. Good. So now I have to share um, my browser. Um, wait a bit. So, or, or maybe before we continue, up to here, are there any questions you would, you would like to ask? A uh, short question, Rosanne. Yes, yes. So, uh, before you just only show for the elliptic equation, what about for the heat equation? Do you still have the uh, same formula? We just integrate okay. over time or? Uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's not a problem. So I will also talk a little bit about in stationary problems um, uh, later, uh, but uh, that's a good question. So what happens if we, um, yes. uh, can, I, can I write here? Uh, so uh, what happens if we have the heat equation instead of the stationary case where uh, you don't have to do much? So what you will get is um, in, the, in the weak formulation, so again, if we uh, multiply with the test function phi and then integrate over the domain, what we would get uh, from this, oops, uh, can you, oh, oh wait, uh, can you see? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, wait, I have to close this because it's a, uh, wait a bit. Sometimes it bugs around. So, okay, good. Now it works. So if you, if you multiply with the test function and then integrate, um, what you would get is just, uh, yeah, the derivative. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I write it in this notation. Okay. So yeah, you would get this part here. Uh, omega uh, is uh, a plus. Again, the bilinear form. Um, okay, great view. Good. Okay. Uh, okay, and then plus uh, the uh, right hand side. Okay, so okay. and this is not a problem at all. Um, I mean, um, if you discretize it, uh, you would not only get a u is equal to b, mm -hmm. but also an additional term, a matrix m, which is called the mass matrix times the derivative of you. So okay. yeah, uh, you would get this discretized version here, and then you can use uh, normal time integrators uh, to, to solve okay. the heat equation. Okay, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, let me switch my screen. So uh, you can also log in into Buryang now. And then uh, this is uh, some kind of a, a tutorial from scratch. So you can just follow what I write if you want to and try it yourself, okay? Uh, because uh, scripting in ng-solve is really not that uh, um, hard. Um, let me log in first. Yeah, but uh, sometimes I think the connection is not perfect from here, so it takes a while until it loads uh, on my side. Um, but I hope it works. Okay, uh, give me some time. Actually, mm. you can just also yes. use your desktop. Rajan, and then uh, I think uh, the people here can just work in Guriang and you okay. can... Okay, uh, the, yeah, th there's a small problem about that. I I'm using Windows. So normally I'm uh, working with my office uh, desktop for, for using ng-solve, but now I'm using Windows. Um, it is possible to do it, but I haven't got uh, the web UI to work for, for the Windows version. So uh, yeah, I hope that's not a problem. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, let me share. 
this is it right? Okay, so can you see um, the browser now? So maybe some kind of um, chat. Okay, good. So, um, okay, the first thing uh, we need are the NGSoft modules. So what you can do is, um, um, oh, by the way, if it's too small or, or something like that, uh, just tell me, okay, uh, maybe I can make it bigger. Um, so what we can do is uh, yeah, we, we just import everything from ng-solve, okay? And um, we can first see what is included in, uh, in, in the package. So there are a lot of things here, actually. So if you um, import it all, but uh, the things that are important for us, uh, yeah, I, I will tell you that, but uh, I, I, I just want to uh, tell you that if you want to know what is loaded, so you can just uh, write print here, here. Okay, we just import everything now. And uh, we also need for the visualization, the web GUI, uh, which can be imported by yeah, uh, importing the draw function here from, from the web GUI module. And um, okay, good. That's it. Uh, the first thing what we want to do is um, wait a bit. Uh, we want to define a mesh. Okay, I, I will also talk about meshing uh, in the second part um, of this tutorial. But first, uh, we want to have a mesh, and then uh, there's a predefined mesh here called the unit square. And as we have guessed, this is just the unit square. And if we set the mesh equal to the um, unit square, which is a geometry. So um, we, um, from the geometry, we need to generate a mesh, okay? Um, where we prescribe the um, maximum width uh, equal to 1.2, for example. So good. Um, and to draw the mesh, you can just call the draw function and uh, do something like this. And I hope that it is here. Okay, a uh, little bit different what, uh, to what normally happens on my computer, but uh, uh, wait, but I hope. Uh, okay, it's a bit different um, to what I'm used to. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure why I have to scroll here. So perhaps it's a bad idea to, to do it. You can just click there. Yeah. Yeah, I think in, uh, you can click on the right side. No, on the left side. Here. Yeah. Yeah, ah, no. okay, that's that's what I wanted. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I was just confused about that. Okay, good. So this is our mesh, what we have gotten. Okay. And uh, you can specify also the uh, maximum width with, uh, with this parameter here. And so if you have, uh, if you want to uh, have a finer uh, discretization, uh, you can just set it uh, however you want. So, and um, now if we have a mesh, we can define a finite element space. So a finite element space, this is the H1 space that I have told you before, okay? So we want an H1 space defined on the mesh MSH with the order one. So the order is just the order or, or the degree of the polynomials that we have. So order one means linear polynomials. And uh, then we also have to specify Dirichlet uh, boundary conditions. And uh, I specify them uh, by saying, or it should be, uh, so on the bottom, on the right, uh, on the top, and on the left, um, we should have um, Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay, so nothing happened. Uh, so how did I get these uh, specifications uh, for the boundaries? You can just uh, print or, or call the msh dot get boundaries. Okay. Uh, to print, so you can see it uh, here below to see what kind of uh, boundaries the mesh has. Okay, so the, uh, in, in the predefined unit square, you can see uh, it's bottom, right, top, and left, but you can also specify other kinds of uh, geometries. 
And by the way, uh, the help function is quite helpful uh, if you want to see the documentation of ng-solve. So if you are not sure, uh, so which, uh, function, uh, which methods are present uh, for, for the mesh class, uh, you can just type help mesh. And then there's a really detailed documentation about the mesh class where you also see, for example, uh, the get boundaries function, uh, which returns a list of boundary condition names. Okay, so if you ever feel stuck working with ng-solve, you can just uh, use the, the documentation page or uh, the help um, method in Python. Good. So we have a mesh, and then we have the finite element space, which is the H1 function with prescribed uh, digitally boundary conditions. And now, um, again, uh, important, uh, if we have a finite element space, we can uh, create something which is called a proxy function. So U should be the trial function. So this is the function that we want to compute. V should be the test function. So in the weak formulation I have shown you before. And now we define our problem. So A should be our bilinear form. So you can also just write it like this. And the bilinear form should be defined over the finite element space FES. And uh, because this is also a symmetric uh, bilinear form, uh, we can uh, add this flag symmetric is equal to true, uh, such that it is computed more efficiently. And um, now we define our problem. So we have the gradient of u times the gradient of v times um, the volume element dx. So you can just write the problem like this. And b should be our uh, linear form. So the right hand side, uh, or in this case, just uh, yeah, the, the source term. And um, for the source term, uh, this is quite arbitrary, but uh, I would like uh, to get uh, the following function here. So this is uh, just some test uh, function that I uh, would like to test with uh, times V times dx, okay? So this is our problem. And um, now if, if we have done this, the only thing that we have to do in ng-solve is just to call the assemble function. So what, what this does is so we, uh, we have a symbolic representation of our problem. And in this small little call here, assemble, uh, everything complicated, uh, what I have told you in, in my um, presentation will be automatically done, okay? So this uh, um, yeah, integrating over the save functions uh, for each element and such, uh, this is all done in the assemble function. And yeah, this is uh, like Phoenix, the finite element software, this is quite, um, yeah. Uh, intuitive and also easy to use. So, and after we have assembled A and B, we can call the matrices and the factors that we get from, uh, from this uh, compilation. And now uh, to get the solution, uh, we define a grid function. So a grid function is just a function um, which is defined in the finite element space. So, and it stores the nodal values uh, with respect to the given mesh, okay? And um, uh, so a grid function has the fact uh, attribute here, which is just the factor corresponding to the nodal values. And uh, ng-solve has its own um, yeah, linear algebra library. So uh, you can work with factors and matrices uh, very easily here. And if you want uh, to set the entries of the factor, you need to call its data and uh, assign uh, some other kind of data. For example, here, uh, the solution should be the, uh, the, uh, should be the solution to the linear equation. So we want to um, compute the inverse of the matrix A times uh, the right-hand side B, okay? So, and uh, actually I have written the inverse here times um, the factor B, but what is actually done, so this is all just symbolic. So what is actually done in the computation is it computes um, LU uh, decomposition of the matrix and uh, solves the linear equation system using uh, yeah, uh, back solving and forward solving. So 
uh, even if I write down the inference of it. So what, what is done internally is uh, an efficient, a more efficient way to um, compute the solution. You can even, uh, I forgot how it's called. Uh, let me check. Uh, you can even uh, use uh, other methods like a sparse Koleski or something like that to uh, to compute the solutions. But uh, anyway, um, if we have done this, we can just draw the solution. Okay, so and this is our code, and this is what uh, we would get. Yeah, this is the web uh, the UI uh, visualization. And uh, if you prefer, for example, uh, uh, a graph uh, over this uh, colorful image, you can also open the controls here. And here there's a deformation um, variable where yeah, for, you can deform it so that uh, you see what is happening here. So this is the solution uh, to the Poisson equation with a zero Dirichlet boundary conditions over the unit square. OK, so maybe I will. Um, so you the uh, code again. So this is a minimal working example. Um, do you have any questions? Yeah. So uh, let me take uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, okay. Good. Sorry. So any, any questions up to here? Uh, how do we choose for yeah. the linear circle that you want to use? Again, sorry, uh, uh, the linear solver. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. There, there are many ways to do it. So mm -hmm. you can even use uh, your own or maybe from another library if you want to convert the um, data and stuff. So you can also use SciPy or uh, okay. NumPy libraries to do it. But uh, this also has its own um, solver. So if we know, for example, that's the, that the matrix is symmetric, we can, for example, specify uh, we compute uh, the inference using the sparse color scheme method, for example, if okay. it's uh, symmetric, and then it will just do it like that. So, okay. okay. On the documentation page, uh, you will find a list of what is available and also how uh, you can use uh, external solvers uh, for your problems. So that should not be a problem. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good. I have yeah. a question. Yes. Uh, uh, I think. With all this you've shown to us, I think it's much more simple problem with the like box model, right? What if it's something that more like abstract now? The thing that you know, like you showed before, like like the 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 form is not like a box, but so it's easy for a box. We define the the boundary condition, yes, this bottom rev and and that kind of stuff. What if the form is not a box? Okay. Not yeah, uh, this would be the uh, second part of my uh, tutorial. So yes, I, I will come to that. Okay, so sorry. the second part would be how to um, uh, model the geometry and also how to generate meshes from from the geometry of uh, model. Okay. So, but uh, up until this point, I hope that this is clear. So what we need is just a mesh, and I will talk about how we get uh, other kinds of meshes. Uh, we need the finite element space here. I have used the H1 space, but there are also other problems where you need, for example, divergence-free spaces or rotation-free spaces. Um, there's also a list of what is available. And again, you can always um, use this print there to see what is available. Uh, this is not the best way to see what is available, but uh, if you are lazy, you can do it. And for example, there's the H1 space, there's the H curl space, H curl curl, H curl diff. So yeah, um, there are a lot but of elements. Yes? Is it uh, relevant then for for this kind of method to use like CAD modeling and CAD, you know? Uh, CAD? Yeah, I, I know CAD. So uh, the question is whether you can import it or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's yes. fine. Uh, it is possible. I will not cover it today. Uh, it is a bit uh, involved, but you can actually generate your own message. And so you are not restricted to the predefined things. So um, if you have a model from the CAD, of course, we have to convert it first into, into a data which, is, which can be read with Python. And yeah, uh, yeah, you can just import it. So uh, that, that is possible. So there is no like a built-in like parse? Uh, a built-in parse. Uh, de it depends on what you have. Um, uh, well, I mean, what kind of CAD file do, I, do you have? So, 
I'm not familiar with this. I haven't worked with this before, but you can look up in the documentation whether there's a built-in function for that. Okay, but uh, if there is no built-in, um, so you can actually access a lot of things. So um, uh, you can also define meshes by hand. So uh, that, that should be possible. Good. So uh, to the second part of my tutorial, so how do we gener generate uh, meshes? Um, for that, maybe I will um, rename this part as uh, tutorial one. And uh, let's close it and uh, create uh, another um, Python notebook. Actually, I can just continue with the previous uh, one, but I, I would like to have a, a clear uh, console. Oh, okay, so uh, what we do now here is, uh, let's check a bit. So we want to generate meshes and there are quite a lot of tools and also different tools um, um, you can use um, for, for meshing. And um, yeah, let me uh, just uh, import the um, things again that we need. Uh, wait, uh, let the UI import um, draw for drawing. And now instead of the unit square uh, from the NetGen module for, for, for two dimensional geometries, uh, you can import the spline geometry. So we can, you can, this is just one example. There are also other methods. So uh, I think there are three methods you can generate um, um, geometries with. Uh, you can use constructive solid geometry. So you have some predefined geometries and then you can compute uh, the intersection, the difference or the union of uh, predefined uh, uh, geometries. You can use the spline geometry. So by, by specifying control points, you can create your own geometries. And there's also quite recently, I haven't worked with it before, but there's also the uh, bindings for op open cascade, if you are familiar with it, uh, which is some kind of a geometry tool. Um, yeah, so it is added quite recently. So you can use it if you are familiar with open cascade. So, okay, so now with the spline geometry, what uh, can we do? So we have three different kinds of um, data structures. The first one is the geometry, for example, the spline geometry here. And um, we can also add some kind of um, uh, predefined um, uh, things, for example, we want to have a rectangle um, or, or maybe may, maybe a circle for us uh, because we have seen a, a rectangle before. So we can add a circle um, with, um, with the midpoint uh, zero, the radius one, and uh, we want to specify how the boundary is called. So before it, for the unit square, we have the bottom, left, top, right uh, boundary. Now we can specify the boundary of the circle. I just call it circ. And um, we can also uh, wait, uh, set something like, uh, okay, no, no, it's, it's, it's later. Okay, no, no, not important for now, but uh, so uh, there is the geometry function. This is a spline geometry. From this spline geometry, you can generate uh, an N, uh, a NetGen mesh yeah, by calling the generate mesh. So as I told you before, ng-solve is based on the package netgen. And um, what you do first is to convert, uh, to, to create the mesh here uh, to a netgen mesh. And then from this netgen mesh, you want to prepare it for the finite element method. And uh, for that, uh, you call the mesh function. So the actual mesh, which you use for ng-solve, is obtained um, by doing mess of NGM. Okay, so and now we can uh, draw uh, draw the whole thing, and what we would get is uh, a circle which is discretized into triangles. Okay, so but uh, you can also use curve boundaries in uh, ng solve. So if you want to have the exact representation of a circle, not just some kind of uh, discretization like this, if you want to represent the geometry exactly, you can also call the curve function from it. So if we call curve two, it means that at the boundary, 
uh, we will interpolate it with a quadratic function. Okay, so and if you do that, then the mesh is represented exactly. You can also do it for cubic uh, uh, polynomials or higher order polynomials, but usually cu cubic is pretty much uh, enough to represent any kind of uh, um, boundary you have uh, from CAD. And um, you can also think uh, do things like, oh, uh, uh, okay, maybe we don't have any uh, much time. Maybe I will skip this part. Maybe more important is, uh, yeah, more important is, uh, so add circle is still a predefined object. And now what I would like to do is, um, let's clear the output uh, to define my own geometries, okay? And for that, um, I think we can put it here and then create another one. Let's load this. And now um, what about, oh, I want to create my own geometry. For example, what I want to do now is a Carter of a plate with a Carter circle in the left corner. So that's uh, what I would like to do. So, and for that, I define uh, the points I want to use. So uh, I have already um, written this before. So I want these points here. Um, zero, one, one, one. Okay, so these are uh, six points. And um, you can call for each point, you can call the, um, uh, the method append point to append a point to your spline, a spline geometry. Yeah, you, uh, but if you want to do it for all of the six points, uh, I mean, fortunately, this is Python, uh, we can use it, uh, we can do the following assignment here. So we append each point for each point PT in PTS. So, and a PID is, are just the IDs of the point. So this, just, this would be a factor which uh, contains zero until uh, five. So we have defined the points. And now what uh, we do is we, um, uh, Okay, actually we can also do, uh, okay, uh, no, uh, uh, okay, let, 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 let me just stop. Uh, so zero point append, and then we can append a line, yeah, from the first point to the second point. And we can also call the boundary, this would be the um, bottom boundary, if I'm not mistaken, okay. So uh, this is the bottom uh, boundary, and then we can, I mean, it's uh, quite tedious, but uh, we can just do the same for everything. Uh, I could write a, a loop for this, but I wanted to show you something else. So um, I will do it uh, manually. At the end, we will connect the last uh, point with the first point. And uh, for the last point, we also want to have to have a spline. Oh wait, this is uh, this is uh, okay. This is too much. Uh, for the last point, uh, we would like to have a spline uh, for representing the Carter circle. Okay, and oh sorry, uh, for the boundary conditions, uh, we can call them right. Uh, then top, oops. Uh, okay, uh, I don't like the auto uh, fill function here, but okay. So this is the left boundary. And for the last part, this would be our uh, left arc. So this is an arc, good. And then, yeah, we generate the mesh. And we want also it to uh, to uh, we want, we want also have um, curve boundaries. Good. So this is what we get. Yeah. So I have defined the six points here, and then for each segment, I uh, yeah well uh, just uh, connected them with lines and also splines. Okay. And using this, I can also specify my own 
uh, boundary conditions. So this would be the bottom, the right one, the top one, the left one, and the arc. So, and you can specify different kinds of boundary conditions for each, um, for each, uh, yeah, boundary. Okay, and uh, I think this is what this this was planned, but I I I think I don't have enough time for that. Namely, you can also specify periodic boundaries. So, if you want to have a domain, uh, which is a um uh, how do you call it, which is a square, and you have a hole in the middle, yeah, but you don't want to. Uh, simulate it on on the whole domain. You just want to simulate it on a carter of the domain. You can also specify periodic boundary conditions such that the bottom, uh, so such that the bottom part here connects to the um, yeah, to the left part here. So it is not considered a boundary, but it's just a continuation um, of uh, of this part here. So you can also do it, but I think uh, because of the time, I will, I will not do it. So uh, what I will do is to show the last um, uh, method, how you can generate geometries. It is uh, using uh, let's see, uh, the constructive uh, solid uh, geometry. So uh, what, we could, what you can do is, um, where is it? Okay, so uh, let me, so this is important. What we need then is uh, the net gen, uh, uh, this is, okay, this is possible in 2D, but I will also do it in 3D. So uh, um, for, for the 3D case, uh, we need the package CSG. And uh, yeah, so if we import it, then we can just uh, define a cube by, an, for example, an author brick um, with the following points. Um, okay, a hole with the cylinder. Um, so this should be a cylinder which, um, uh, whose axis uh, intersects the two points uh, I specify here. Um, is it? Okay, so, and uh, now we can define the object OBG now by just saying, oh, it should be the cube without the hole, okay? So, and uh, the geometry is now a so-called CS. So, so we, ha we had the spline geometry before, now we have a constructive solid geometry. So we call the uh, CS geometry. And then we can add the geometry here into this. And uh, again, the mesh is created by calling the mesh uh, class of the uh, generated uh, NetGen mesh um, with some uh, specification. So again, the maximum width should be 0 0.1, and then we want it to be curved also. And yes, if you do this, uh, okay, uh, may I, okay, good. I have to scroll down. Maybe, maybe I should uh, remove this uh, whole notification, but what we would get is again, uh, so we can we can yeah use constructive geometry like this. Um, yeah, you have a cube without the cylinder in it. Okay, and also um, more complicated uh, things can also be done uh, by using the primitives and then uh, yeah creating the union, the differences, and so on. So for example, if I add a sphere. Um, bloop, uh, with this specifications and then, oh, I want the cube without the hole and then I want the intersection with this uh, with the sphere. And also I want that the hole is uh, refined more than the other parts of the geometry. Then I can, for example, say, oh, the maximum width here should be smaller. And if we do that and scroll down, yeah, we have uh, the cube 
without the cylinder uh, and the intersection of it uh, with uh, the sphere of radius 0 0.75. And also here, uh, the mass in the interior, because I specified that it should be smaller. Uh, yeah, it is also discretized more uh, finely uh, compared to the other parts of the geometry. Okay, So this is just a demonstration of what you can do in um, uh, in the mass uh, generator uh, in NGSolve. Of course, there are still a lot of things that you can do, but uh, I cannot tell it uh, to you uh, today uh, because of the time constraints. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, for, for closing it. So um, you, uh, I actually wanted also to, to talk about the trans uh, transient problem. So about the heat equation, you can also do it uh, here in NGSolve by again, uh, using the mass matrix and some kind of uh, integrator, a time integrator. And uh, you can also solve nonlinear problems. All, if you want to look it up, just go to the docu.ng-solve.org. And, and here you also have interactive tutorials for, uh, for ng-solve. So, and it is quite detailed. Uh, uh, I mean, there's the uh, Poisson equation, the Maxwell's equation, I think the magnetostatics, uh, yes, here is also um, considered. You can also do the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, linear and nonlinear elasticity. Uh, those are the um, yeah, very first examples that uh, you will see on this uh, page here. And then uh, you will also learn about how um, yeah how, how the data structures are structured uh, and also some advanced topics, also time dependent and nonlinear problems, more about the geometric modeling. So I have told you about how to generate geometries in 2D, the constructive solid geometry, and again, there's another thing which is called the open cascade uh, technology geometry. And this is quite new and also quite applicable. For example, here's the bottle tutorial where you can also create some kind of uh, um, bottle uh, like this. Oops. Yeah, so um, yeah, there's still a lot to be said about this and uh, also here is a part about uh, MP about parallelization. So if you want to uh, experiment in, um, in uh, on, on the Google Young SPC, you can look it uh, up here. So I haven't tried it uh, myself, but uh, it should be possible uh, because NGSoft also uh, supports MPI. Yeah, and as closing remarks, uh, I will return to, where is it? I will return to, my presentation. Okay, so hopefully you can see it. So as a closing remark, if you want to know more about the finite element method, there's this book written by Dietrich Press. This is where I learn uh, everything. Well, so this is kind of a mix of mathematical and uh, applicative. So uh, this is a good mix, I think, if you know some math, and want to learn the finite element method. If you want to go deeper into the theory, I uh, can suggest the following book here, The Mathematical Theory of Finite Element Methods written by Brenner and Scott. If you want to have a kind of uh, engineering uh, introduction into the finite element method, uh, I highly suggest uh, the first part or, or maybe the whole book here, um, the automated solution of differential equations by, by the finite element method. So this is actually the tutorial into the Phoenix uh, project. So uh, the, the, uh, the other um, popular computing platform for solving PDEs. And I think it is explained quite well in this book here. And if you want to know more about um, NGSolve, so how it works and, and so, um, so again, it is written by Joachim Schubel. So there's also a technical report about the implementation of finite elements in NGSolve. Good. So yeah, uh, I'm done with my presentation. Thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Okay, maybe I'm going to say this in English first. Thank okay. you very much, Mr. Rosen, for giving us such an interesting and informative presentation and tutorial. Starting from the finite difference, uh, the NGSolve, and so much more that I couldn't mention. 
sekali lagi terima kasih banyak kepada Pak Razan atas ilmunya yang sangat bermanfaat dan tadi juga ada beberapa yang masih mengetahuinya masih sedikit-sedikit gitu jadi banyak ilmu baru yang kita dapatkan dari pengaturan tersebut uh, sebelumnya uh, untuk Bapak Ibu dan teman-teman peserta workshop diharapkan untuk mengisi daftar hadir yang akan saya berikan di kolom chat nah uh, kemudian selanjutnya kita akan masuk ke sesi tanya jawab Untuk Bapak, Ibu, dan teman-teman peserta workshop yang ingin bertanya mengenai apa yang tadi sudah disampaikan, dipersilahkan untuk menggunakan fitur raise hand-nya. Atau boleh juga untuk mengetik pertanyaannya di kolom chat. Silakan untuk bertanya. Mungkin dari, dari saya, Nadia. Ya. Rojan, uh... How we simulate the moving boundary? Ah, simulate the moving boundary. Okay, this is uh, possible. Um, so the only thing you have to do is uh, okay. Maybe I, I will just tell, tell you so that there's a method where you can um, uh, deform the boundary. So just uh, I mean you have to give mesh, and then you can just uh, say mesh point. Um, uh, how is it called again? A set deformation. And then you have a deformation field that you have to um, yeah, input. And then you can also work with deform deformable um, boundaries. This is not a problem. But of course, if the deformation is quite big, if you get something which is uh, rather pretty different, then you require a remeshing of, of the whole um, mesh because otherwise you would get elements which are very thin and this is for the analysis not good mm. thanks okay so any other question I, i don't know so perhaps it was a little bit too technical from my side but uh, but i hope that you can follow the basic idea so i hope that today at least for those who don't know uh, you know the general idea of of the finite element method uh I have a question too. Yes. How about we? How about how about the thing that we have? What about error? Do, we, do they have like uh, a functionality? To, is our solution is accurate or not? How do we know that? Ah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. I. I also wanted to talk about this, but. Uh, yeah. Time constraints. I think I did not prepare it uh, very well for for this one and a half hour. Um. So about the analysis, uh, to um, uh, for example, for, for for the okay, maybe I can go back to the um, uh, browser. So again, so my tutorial was taken from this uh, documentation here. So and there's a, the Poisson equation again. So this is exactly what I have done with you. Perhaps I should just maybe just just present this page here would be much better. So. Um, at the end, uh, so perhaps you can, for example, compute the, uh, okay, so for, for this particular example, um, with this uh, right-hand side here, the exact solution is, uh, actually, ana is actually analytic and uh, is given by 16 times, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean this, this expression here. And uh, to, to see how good the approximation is, for example, you can uh, print the L2 error. So the L2 error is just the error of, of the, I mean, yeah, the, the integral, I mean, of the square integral. And you can compute it by yeah, calling the square root of this the integrate function. And here you can input your grid function. So the solution you have minus your exact solution. And as we can see here, the L2 error, so how good is this approximation? It's uh, five point, uh, so it's exact up to five point uh, to the power of um, yeah, minus five. Okay? And if we, for example, here raise, I don't know the, um, I mean, if we, can we do it here? Okay, unfortunately not, but if you, for example, reduce uh, the um, maximum width, then, it should be smaller than, than this, okay? I mean, this uh, problem that they have the analytical solution, what if we don't have that analytical solution? Okay, uh, if we don't have that analytical solution, then there's something uh, called 
um, how do you call it? Uh, I, I forgot the term of it. So what you could do is, uh, this is also important for adaptive refinement, if you have heard of it. So if we have some places where we require a higher resolution of the mesh, then we want to know, oh, where is the, where is the error big and where is the error small? And there are, uh, oh, okay, it's called error estimation. And uh, there are a lot of methods to do it. So there's the residual error estimator, or um, maybe a simpler one is the so-called uh, multi-grid uh, error estimator where um, to estimate the error, you can compute the same solution with the final grid. And then you compare the difference between um, the, uh, so you can compare the core solution with the fine solution. And then mathematically, in some cases, uh, you can uh, yeah, construct an error estimator uh, for, um, yeah, 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 for the problem. So is it clear? So yeah, the basic idea, well, the one idea is just to compute the solution again for a finer mesh and then compare the two solutions um, yeah, with some uh, mathematical transformations. <laughs> right, so that does mean, so we need to do all the computation that much bigger so we can have an error then if you do it that way. Yes, yes, exactly. But this is just one way. So again, there's the residual estimator, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, there are a lot of ways how to do it. Um, yeah, that's just one way. Uh, and of course, it's uh, not that uh, computer is stationary efficient uh, if you want to do it like that. So there are better ways, of course. Thank okay. Nah, mungkin kepada Bapak Ibu dan teman-teman peserta ada yang ingin ditanyakan lagi? Silakan. Okay, no questions. So perhaps I will just show you something. So again, I I'm working with cells. So um you can also use a surface finite elements. So where the meshes are uh, not well flat domains, but also curve or uh, geometries like the cylinder here. And for example, if you solve the nonlinear cell equations, uh, you, for example, would get the uh, following picture here. So yeah, I mean, uh, just just some so cases. So you can you can also show it. Uh, you can also look at it here in in uh, in the documentation and also important for me there's also uh this is pretty new so this was added i think some days ago um it's about safe and the topology optimization so my my resource focus you can also do um partial differential equation constraint safe optimization in engine solve which is the main reason why i like to use it Okay, no other questions? Yeah, okay then, uh, thank you everyone uh, for having me. And again, uh, if you have any questions regarding it, you can look at the documentation or also maybe we can also talk uh, uh, about it together. So I'm also actually quite new to uh, NGSOL, so I have not worked at the, uh, at the start of my PhD, I, I just know it uh, several months ago. So, uh, yeah, but, but it is quite promising. Oke, mungkin uh, untuk yang bertanya sudah cukup ya, karena mungkin sudah cukup jelas juga. Uh, mungkin untuk hari ini, untuk malam ini akan saya tutup. Uh, terima kasih kepada Pak Rozan yang sudah membagikan ilmunya kepada kita semua. Semoga apa yang tadi disampaikan dapat dimanfaatkan untuk kita semua juga ya. Uh, mungkin saya persilakan ke Pak Yudi untuk memberikan sedikit closing statement untuk malam hari ini. Kepada Pak Yudi dipersilakan Pak. Terima kasih Nadia dan terima kasih juga rekan-rekan sekalian sudah bertahan sampai jam berapa ini? Setengah 10 lebih ya. Jadi mudah-mudahan kita semua uh, mengambil banyak ke uh, belajar banyak hari ini dan kalau saya tidak salah ya kalau kita membaca atau belajar sebelum tidur itu suka kenapa kalau bahasa 
Inggrisnya tuh. <laughs> Mudah-mudahan saja ini juga memberikan inspirasi. Jadi rekan-rekan semua nanti sampai termimpi-mimpi ini NG Solve itu besok ketika dibangunkan oleh istri atau oleh siapa ibu itu langsung teriak NG Solve. <laughs> ya. Baik, terima kasih dan mungkin uh, dari saya cukup Nadia, silakan ditutup saja dan selamat malam. Boleh bertanya Pak Yudi? Oh ya, mangga mangga Mas mangga mangga. Mungkin kita ya. informal saja sekarang ya. Oke, okay, ya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih juga buat uh, Rojan ya. Uh, saya uh, kemarin tuh nggak nggak hadir, jadi saya ingin tahu uh, apakah kita peserta diberi akses untuk ke Guriang nggak Pak? Diberi, Pak Asep, uh, Pak Asep sudah ini nggak uh, mendaftarkan ke sana nggak? Karena otomatis itu di ininya. Jadi oh, kalau belum kita masuk ke dashboard, kemudian ya. register, diisi itu. Nah nanti uh, apa namanya kita buatnya otomatis oh, tidak. Oke, okay. ya. ya, 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 terima kasih. Ya. Kalau nggak saya, ya, semuanya yang lain sudah ya sudah memiliki akun. Baik, ditutup saja mungkin Nadia. Oke, baik, uh, mungkin untuk malam ini dicukupkan dulu untuk uh, workshopnya. Terima kasih sekali lagi terima kasih kepada Pak Rozan atas pemateriannya dan juga terima kasih kepada Bapak Ibu dan teman-teman peserta yang sudah menghadiri uh, workshop pada malam hari ini. Saya Nadia selaku moderator pamit undur diri. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Rosan, terima kasih Rosan ya. ya. Terima kasih. Ya, ya. Jadi eh, besok masih ada dari mungkin Raihan ya yang ini tentang REMS. Kalau kemudian berikutnya Lusa itu teknik itu tentang IT. Tentang IT kita belajar teknologi yang terkini, teknologinya Google menggunakan Kubernetes. Bagaimana kita mengelola HPC lebih uh, efisien? <laughs> Itu mungkin. Kenapa Maureen nggak disuruh ngomong Pak Yudi? Kenapa? Kenapa Maureen nggak disuruh presentasi? <laughs> Saya suruh. Sebenarnya besok itu bagian Maureen. Asik. <laughs> Cuma Maureen sedang sibuk barangkali ya. <laughs> Karena Maureen punya tiga anak buah. Wah, keren. Lagian lagi nggak bisa. Yang masuk komputer. SD. <laughs> lagi lagi nggak bisa komputernya di <laughs> baik terima kasih semuanya ya izin ya oke okay. mas Rozan ada yang ya ya Bu Elena